Maybe, maybe not. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Thumbs up, okay. Sounds like we can start talking. Good afternoon, Bay Threat. We're going to get started talking about WebSockets, WebSockets hacking. So could try to grab your attention and we'll try and talk over you or do the best we can. One of the things I will say is that uh, we lost our, our uh, Russian colleague, Vagen, can't be here. Uh, he supposedly got sick last night. Uh, I think he actually saw Rocky IV for the first time and was too depressed to come in. So that would, that's the excuse at least. But in any case, we also have Sergey here and we'll be talking about WebSockets. So we only have about the amount of time that was allotted to the old Saturday morning cartoons from the 80s. So we're going to try to stick to that concept. And without any commercial breaks, we're going to, like Voltron, bring a whole bunch of ideas together about the findings and observations around WebSockets. So in the past, web applications have always wanted to find some legitimate use cases for persistent connections. However, regardless of whether they're using long polling, they're using XHR, they're using DOM tricks, all of these are legitimate, but they tend to fail like those cartoon villains' plans. They never quite work out like Skeletor or Hordak or Cobra Commander expected them to. That's not to say that there aren't really good ways of emulating a WebSocket-like connection. The problem is that HTTP was never intended to be uh, used for persistent continuous communications. Now, HTML5 did introduce server send events. That was a proper way to implement long polling. In other words, if you have a web application that just needs to listen for data, in other words, it's a passive observer of stuff coming in, perhaps it's stock quotes, perhaps it's tweets, perhaps it's other types of updates, server sent events is going to work for you. However, it's unidirectional, so it's not quite where we need to be. And where we need to be is RFC 6455 WebSockets. It's a way, basically, to encapsulate any other protocol on top of RFC 2616, which is HTTP, and it's not quite as messy as RFC 1149. Now, there's two major components to WebSockets. One aspect is the protocol itself, the communication channel. And it's intended to be very low overhead, very low complexity. The other side is what lives in the browser. And this is your JavaScript API. And again, it too is very simple, low complexity. You send data with the send method, you receive with an on message, and then you have an open close and an on error event to round out that method. So all in all, very simple, very easy to use. So continue with the introduction, I'll talk a little bit more about the handshake and what things look like. So to actually establish a WebSocket connection, you need to go through an HTTP handshake. The browser sends a challenge. And part of this challenge is a sec WebSocket key. This is 128 uh, random bits. That's a 16D8 for any of you role players out there. The server then is going to respond to that challenge with essentially a hash of the challenge key as well as a GUID defined by the RFC. There's one other aspect of this handshake that's important to point out. That's the connection upgrade header. What this header basically says is, sure, we've agreed on this handshake. Now we can start talking WebSockets. However, a little while ago, uh, Carnegie Mellon and some Google researchers did a, some, some research using the Chrome browser and some of the Chrome users. And they found that many proxies were unfortunately stripping that connection upgrade header, thus killing the entire WebSocket process. What they found, however, if you use WSS, which is essentially WebSockets over the SSL TLS, then most of the intermediate proxies wouldn't interfere with it in any way. So one recommendation right there is use WSS. Not only are you going to make a more secure and, uh, experience for your users, but you're actually going to be able to grade that connection in the first place. Now, there's some important points to make about the handshake. One, all it proves is that both endpoints are ready to speak WebSockets. It's not a cryptographic test of identity or trust. What it's intended to do is prevent things like cross-protocol attacks, which I'll mention in a little bit. Another thing is that the handshake is also sp only supposed to be established 
when you have the same type of content. In other words, no mixed content, no crossing the streams of HTTP, HTTPS, WS, or WSS. And finally, browsers are also supposed to implement or limit uh, the number of pending connections that can be established you know, in order to prevent connection flooding coming out of the user agent. But let's imagine that we've got a successful handshake done, out of the way, and we're going to stop talking HTTP, and we're going to start talking WebSocket data frames. So the data frames I mentioned is very, very simple, very straightforward. At a minimum, it's going to have two bytes. It's going to have a couple flags, and it's going to have a length. At maximum, the overhead is going to be 14 bytes. So even if we were talking about an XHR request, or if we were talking about vanilla HTTP, we're talking an order of magnitude improvement in terms of the, the amount of overhead within this. Now, two of the important aspects I want to point out on this nice ASCII diagram is the masking key and the payload length. The payload length itself is pretty interesting. It, it can define the length of the payload in 7, 16, or 64 bits. Now, if you think of a similar situation like overlong UTF-8 encoding, you can start to imagine some security problems that can arise where, where you have variable encoding used to bypass detection mechanisms or that can be used to potentially cross security boundaries because you can represent a number like 19 in 7 bits or define its overlong representations in 16 or 64. The other aspect of the WebSocket data frame that's really interesting is the masking. The masking is a 32-bit value, random again, and it, it's essentially designed on outgoing data from the browser to prevent the browser space or to prevent a malicious user from doing things like corrupting an intermediate cache proxy by sending WebSocket data that looks like HTML content or by being able to create WebSocket uh, packets that are EHL, EHLO commands that are going to talk to an SMPT server and start sending spam across the internet. So it's by no means an encryption, it's a masking. Because also you're essentially sending uh, the masking key or the decryption key along with the packet itself. Uh, another side about this is that this diagram I was able to create with just a few lines of Scapy in Python. And I, I mention that because it really highlights how simple it is to take apart and deconstruct a WebSocket protocol. So a couple other things that are the part of the design choices of the RFC and that influence what browsers are supposed to control. We already mentioned the masking. Browsers also control ping and pong frames. These are basically the connection keep alives so that you as the developer or you in the user agent land, in the JavaScript land, don't have to worry about that connection. The other thing is that the RFCs and the developers are also pretty cognizant of prior problems, prior security issues that have been around with HTTP and HTML. One of the things they mentioned is they're supposed to minimize the verbosity of errors that are coming back. And this really just means so that WebSockets can't become a better host or port scanner than we can use with things like XHR or the source attribute of image or iframe tags. So finally, to wrap up, one of the important points I want to make in this intro is that you have a security context during the HTTP handshake. It has authentication headers. It has cookies. It has an origin header. However, once you start to decouple that and you move into the protocol within your WebSocket, you might introduce security problems. Imagine the simplest of chat applications where you have, you're sending the, the tracking the sender and the recipient of a message based on strings or a JSON structure that's passed back and forth through that WebSocket. And if that's all you're doing, you can Im imagine quite easily how trivial it would be to spoof now chat messages unless you're still assigning server-side uh, security to the session of the user that's in the chat and the context of those messages within the chat. And that's a subtle, that's a subtle point that we'll come back and revisit. So, I'm going to change the channel here and start to talk a little bit more about the security. Two major things. WebSockets, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, to quote the uh, Pink Floyd. Uh, there's all, everything about mixed content attacks, everything about sniffing, all of that still exists within WebSockets. All it is is another protocol. 
However, there are interesting things about the protocol, and because it's new, because people are newly implementing servers, they're going to potentially just remake a lot of the mistakes of the past. So one of the first mistakes that I want to mention, again, is just that mixed content handling. And we really do want browsers to enforce the restrictions on mixed content. If you load a source over HTTP, don't allow the WSS. If, and this is basically the same thing that the EFF has been trying to tell us, use HTTPS everywhere. Let's start using WSS everywhere as well. I think now I'm going to hand off to Sergey to talk a little bit more about security and denial of service. Hey. Oops. Yeah, so another, another sorry, interesting aspect on WebSockets would be like using it as a source of denial of service. For example, to get a denial of service on a, on a client, uh, it'd be pretty easy because uh, connection limits any browser, any, any, any modern browser that supports WebSockets, they treat connection limit for WebSockets differently from HTTP connection limits. So, uh, and uh, the number is pretty scary, except Firefox that limits by default to 200 uh, concurrent connections to the same origin WebSocket server. Other browsers, uh, as I am aware, do not limit it at all, or it, it would be limited by like file descriptors, by uh, allowed or open file descriptors, um, limitation of your operating system or something else. They basically don't limit anything. And we found this uh, this morning, like if you go, if you load a, a page, an, an HTML page with JavaScript, one line JavaScript that uh, opens tries to open several thousand WebSocket connections like iOS or Safari uh, on iOS 6 or uh, before would just simply hang. And I just figured out that Chrome would also hang. Like everything would hang. Like UI around the frame and everything. It was pretty scary. And like that's a quote from, uh, from, from WebKit bug that they simply, they aware of the problem but for now, they are not going to do anything about it. Or, uh, like, if we look back to the server from the client and imagine that bad guys can uh, use compromised browsers as denial of service or distributed denial of service uh, agents to DOS some third party WebSocket server, uh, it's going to work pretty, pretty well for them. And yeah, and if you are implementing your WebSocket server uh, based on Apache, for example, or any other HTTP-based WebSocket server, be, uh, be, be, uh, uh, I mean, or any other HTTP server, be careful because all those servers were designed to open connections, serve it, and then close it. Or okay, if it's keep alive. Keep it open for five seconds, then close it, or five minutes. In case of WebSocket, your connection is open until you don't close it manually, or don't close your browser, so your server has to handle a lot of concurrent connections. So summarizing the browsers, uh, there's still no, still no mixed, mixed content handling policy implemented. Only Chrome so far. Uh, among WebKit-based browsers implements that. Uh, good thing is that Opera and IE10 preview implement that uh, same content, uh, mixed content handling policy. Uh, there are issues which probably would be fixed soon. Firefox still, uh, still doesn't let uh, web workers create WebSockets inside web workers, which is another HTML5 cool thing. Uh, message sizes. Firefox, for example, uh, used to limit the WebSocket frame to 16 megabytes. Now they bumped the limit to 2 gigabytes. So imagine your client is running on a mobile device or something limited in memory, and I don't know, this could cause many problems probably, even if that exceptions are handle handled properly. Uh, it's not good, I think. Uh, what else we can do with web circuits? For example, fuzz them. Both, or 
we can fuzz three things. Uh, the handshake, basically you fuzz HTTP headers that are talking to WebSocket server or the browser. You can shake, uh, you can fuzz the payload and you can fuzz the, the, the headers themselves. Um, like to fuzz it with to fuzz payload with JavaScript, it's here's the simple uh, JavaScript example how to fuzz the payload and see how servers or backend servers behind WebSockets are handling uh, abnormal data. Or uh, how else you can use fuzzer just to get try to get crash to crash either browser or WebSocket server or something behind it. Uh, also, fingerprinting is pretty easy with WebSockets because uh, because every WebSocket server vendor re-implements HTTP to handle uh, handshake errors, for example. Because if you weren't able to upgrade to WebSocket connection to WebSocket during your uh, handshake, uh, you have to reply. Your server have to, has to reply something in HTTP format. And since every uh, vendor implements their own uh, HTTP responses, you can, this, this is simply a banner. So WebSocket++ library would, ha it has hard-coded server header with WebSocket++ 02 dev, blah, blah, blah. Or for failed handshake, it's also server header is there. Or for autobump item, you can see some patterns there too. And Node.js, so you can easily fingerprint current WebSocket server implementations. And being a security researcher or a developer, you would, you would wonder how to, how can you play with WebSocket traffic? And luckily there are some tools already available. So, um, so Wireshark starting version 1.6 point something uh, natively understands that this HTTP connection upgraded to WebSocket and it would parse it nicely and even apply that masking key and unmask the payload so you can see the plain text payload. Uh, Z attack proxy uh, implemented and even implemented WebSocket support and can even um, has replay capabilities re uh, like replaying WebSocket traffic but and you can fuzz it too but only payload part. And it's I think still in the trunk only uh, the downloadable version doesn't have any WebSocket support, but if you check out the SVN or Git, uh, it'd be there. And finally, like Chrome in Web Inspector, if you click the Network tab, you'll see the WebSocket traffic pretty fine. Like with, although you have to, as I remember, you have to click re click on that Network tab to refresh it. Basically, it won't refresh for you, but it works. Or just simply. You can even either even overload the WebSocket constructor in JavaScript and redirect or constructor end like on uh, send and on message events um, and methods and either redirect everything to or duplicate everything to console or to your third party server if you want. <clears throat> Okay, some other problems we think worth mentioning. Like, as to me or as to us, the main problem with WebSockets is there is no commercial web application firewall or IDS or IPS that would unmask the data and would be able to look into the payload and search for patterns. And it's pretty simple to implement because the as Mike said, masking key is coming. Masking key that payload is masked with is coming with the same WebSocket frame. So just read that masking key, which is four bytes, and then apply it, unmask it. That'd be enough to start at least looking into that payload coming from client to server. And we even talked to some vendors. They said it's not a major attack vector. Yeah, probably in terms of you won't find too many attacks or I don't know, data leaks that use WebSockets, but come on, every, every browser now supports WebSockets and bad guys are there and nothing prevents him to establish that 
communication from compromised browser to WebSocket over uh, to their command and control center or whatever it is over WebSocket, since WebSockets are not monitored at all. And also, WebSockets could be easily used as a cover channel, like very easy. I'm going to show you some very simple demo, if I can. Uh, so I modified echo server and client of WebSocket++ WebSocket library. Like I literally modified like several lines of, or like, okay, several tens of lines of C++ code. So, oops. We're launching the server. Here's the client, but there is a, um, yeah, uh, client takes a secret message as third or a second argument. In this case, this would be this some very secret message or something else or yeah. What the? Yeah, we connect it. We're sending some data to the server. We're receiving it back since it's a, an, an echo server. But if we go to the console of our server, we see that server receives the, the data we send over the plain text WebSocket message, but also every message also delivers this covered data or secret data. And I'm using masking key, which is supposed to be random, but in my case, I'm using it as a like, data, data carrier. So with every WebSocket message, I can deliver four bytes of my useful secret data that no firewall, even if they start looking into WebSocket traffic, they won't probably discover for now. Uh, but this is in case of like controlled client. You can even use WebSockets as, uh, with uncontrolled client, uh, which would be the browser. Uh, I launched my another server, also like several by, uh, several lines of code, and then I launched my very simple web page. I type my I don't know what was it Corona Extra, blah blah, I don't know something, and my secret message, which would be Sierra Nevada. And then I convert it to binary string and I sent it and we go back to the console and we see that my secret message was delivered without any modified client. So what I did, I'm using the opcode that, uh, that uh, tells, that indicates that this message contains either binary data or text data. So I'm, I'm using that bit to flip to deliver my data, basically. So uh, we go back. Oops. So this guy, so WebSocket, JavaScript WebSocket API would set that opcode that indicates if it's a text or, uh, or binary data by, based on the type of the object you pass to the send. So if it's a text, opcode would be set to text. If it's an array buffer or a blob, that flag would be set to binary. So flipping that, I need 104 WebSocket messages to deliver this short data. I mean, it doesn't prove anything, but it indicates that you can use WebSockets as a covert channel even in uncontrolled client environment. And going back to... Yeah, we tried to figure out who is using WebSockets in the wild. So uh, we took Qt WebKit, which is a wrapper around WebKit engine, and we wrote a little program, and we basically overloaded the WebSocket constructor. So uh, I think I lost that slide, but anyway. So we overloaded WebSocket constructor. Uh, so every time WebSocket constructor is being called, 
we get a record in our database with the URL that WebSocket constructor is being called with. And we launched our scanner or our tool on Alexa top 1 million, but we uh, managed to scan only a top 600,000, but it's also pretty <laughs> indicative that pretty much nobody is using WebSocket, at least on their li landing page. Uh, so yeah, we don't even have four digit number on 600,000 websites. So going, looking deeper, it's only 0.15% were using WebSockets on their landing page. But we figured out that 95% uh, 95 of those WebSockets connections were going to the same place, same WebSocket server. That was some kind of uh, customer service chat system. And for free, and like people were just putting that free JavaScript code on their page without even thinking what is it doing or what is it for. So getting rid of that noise only turned out only that less than 1% are using, encryp uh, using encryption or using WSS protocol. So here, uh, yeah, I a little bit messed up my slides order, but anyway. So yeah, true picture is this. The more popular website is, the less chance probably that it is using a website. Not, no, I wouldn't say so, but yeah, okay. Like five websites out of first uh, 100,000 were using WebSockets on their landing page, which is, I don't know, frustrating probably. Oops. And I'm passing it to Mike again. With the time left. With the time left. And we have the mic back. Hello. So to, to wrap up the, the, this portion, one of the things I want to review is just some of the things that Sergey was, uh, was focusing on is the concept of like fuzzing. We, because WebSockets is a new protocol, we can kind of go back to the early 90s of web security because now we have people re-implementing HTTP servers in order to handle these handshakes. So we can have not even simple things like inspecting banners, inspecting the order of banners to figure out is it node, is it a different server, but also we're going to start seeing uh, directory traversal attacks depending on how robust these re-implemented uh, HTTP servers are or for the matter are not. So one of the things we want to say is that even regardless of what we've been talking about here, how much, how cool they could be as a covert channel, you can hijack certain points of entropy within the data frames and, say, and use them as egress uh, mechanisms for command and control of, of whatever software you want. There's a lot of really good reasons to use WebSockets. And they're excellent for things like time critical delivery, when you need, really need that two-way communication flow for having higher throughput, things like that. However, you still want to make sure you're measuring and testing how you're deploying them. For example, uh, to go a little bit geekier, if you're familiar with the Nagel algorithm, the Nagel algorithm within your browser may actually impede some of this traffic if you're sending like lots of little bursty bits of WebSockets data frames. For example, the X and Y coordinates if you're trying to build a browser-based MMO. And so let's see, we've covered most of this. But as I said, as I just mentioned about that like browser-based MMO and you're sending X and Y coordinates over WebSockets, just imagine how perhaps difficult it may be right now to hack uh, games, desktop-based games, because they have watchers, they have governors that are, that are looking for running processes. You don't have the same type of thing within a browser, and you don't have a trusted execution environment within a browser. So now we have protocol attacks. So if we have an MMO, like uh, look up Mozilla's a demo project called Banana Bread. It's basically Quake within your browser using no plugins, using pure HTML5. Imagine if you could take a game like that and you could change your X, Y, and Z coordinates. So now you can fly or you can, you can, you can shift yourself so that enemy fire doesn't hit you. All of these are examples of protocol attacks depending on how well or how poorly the protocol on top of WebSockets has been implemented. And that's the nuance there. WebSockets isn't the problem. How the data being delivered over WebSockets is the problem. Is your, is your protocol uh, 
tied to that session cookie or have you decoupled it once you finish that HTTP handshake? Can you replay, spoof? What about fragments? What about server-side buffer overflows, underflows? When I talked about those, um, the variable length encoding, one of the things I didn't mention was that imagine you have a web server, a web socket server implemented, and you send a data frame that declares itself as containing two gigabytes of data, but only contains a few bytes. If a server is trying to be extra efficient and is going to pre-allocate memory, and it pre-allocates that two gigabytes that you declared is coming, that's a pretty easy DOS to pull off because with only a few packets, you can, you can consume all of the memory on the server. And even if they validate the packet and they, don't, they aren't immediately a vulnerable to this type of pre-allocation attacks, they may be vulnerable to buffer overruns or underruns because you can declare a packet to contain more or less data than it actually does. So these are still really interesting things that you have to consider if you're trying to write your own WebSocket server from scratch. And of course, all the other uh, security recommendations still exist. We talk about WSS, use that SSL TLS later for encrypted communication. Stick to that HTTP handshake. Don't lose the context of cores and authentication headers and the session ID from that. And then finally, to wrap up, three points. One, WebSockets fundamentally are designed to solve connection problems. They're not created to solve security problems. They have built-in design with security in mind and security countermeasures. That's why we have things like the handshake, things like the masking for outgoing connections from the browser. But fundamentally, they real, really are designed just for that bi-directional communication between browser and server. You need to make sure what's going on in the data frame that you know how that data is tied to the session, how that data can be used, and more importantly, how it can be misused. And finally, as uh, Sergey demonstrated with his covert channel, this is kind of the new port 80. If you can remember how many times you've sat through a basics of web security um, presentation and you've seen a firewall that's a big brick wall and there's an arrow pointing through it that says port 80, well, WebSockets is that new cliche diagram because as we mentioned, IDSs, IPSs, WAFs aren't inspecting this traffic right now Plus, they're going to have to inspect, they're going to have to unmask it to inspect it. So that's going to get some overhead right there. So with that, I think we have some time. Uh, we thank you for your attention, and we'll go for some Q&A. Thank check, check. Questions? Check, check, check. No one? Well, if you don't have any questions, or if you don't want to ask the question right now, uh, please find us at the bar, or near the bar, or underneath one of the tables. We'll be happy to answer your questions. Uh, you can also find more information if you track us down on Twitter. They'll also have the slides posted, and we'll be happy to talk more about this. Thank you.